You know, one of the biggest purchases in the last uh, 10 years was clearly Bob Iger buying up Lucasfilm for $4.08 billion. And it wasn't just Lucasfilm. It was Industrial Light and Magic. It was LucasArts. It was Skywalker Sound. And more importantly, the Star Wars franchise. I mean, that's that, at the end of the day, that's what Lucas wanted. Lucas wanted Star Wars, and he has come out lamenting some of his decisions in regards to how that whole thing played out. And he's, he's done it in this new book, this new, uh, this new autobiography, biography, whatever, uh, The Ride of a Lifetime, Lessons Learned from 15 Years as CEO of the Walt Disney Company. And from what, I, what I've gathered about it, there's some interesting things. But the only one I really care about right now, of course, is the deal between Iger and Lucas back in the fall of 2012. I remember when I saw this exchange, when the signing of contracts, when this, when this snapshot happened, it was right before I left Los Angeles and so many people I was film, friends with, filmmakers, they hated it. They hated everything about it. Me, I loved it. I was all for it because I, I was afraid we were never going to see Star Wars again. Now it's a bit of a different situation, even though I'm more hopeful. It has had some dark days. But in this new book, there are some things that uh, that come out, especially in regards to The Force Awakens and how Iger had approached it with, with Lucas, what Lucas had kind of brought to the table, and then ultimately how he got edged out of the picture. And we're going to look at some of these some of these excerpts I, I snagged from Reddit to, to get a better idea as to what happened with Lucas and Iger and Abrams and obviously Episode 7 and the future of the Star Wars saga. So now this is a snippet on George sending in his outlines to the sequel trilogy. At some point in the process, George told me that he had completed outlines for three new movies. He agreed to send us three copies of the outlines, one for me, one for Alan Braverman and one for Alan Horn, who had just been hired to run our studio. Alan Horn and I read George's outlines and we decided we needed to buy them, although we made clear in the purchase agreement that we would not be contractually obligated to adhere to the plot lines he laid out. So they liked it enough to want to purchase it. They liked it enough to really want to purchase it, to make sure that they purchased it. But they also wanted to make sure that just in case something else happened, they could cover their ass. And I feel that's probably more accurate than not. I think I think they liked it but they wanted to make sure they could make it happen. If not, they wanted to be legally protected. And I, I get it, but I, I also still really want to know what those, what those outlines were. Uh, and it goes on to talk here about George's new role of creative authority. Now, Iger says he knew that I was going to stand firm on the question of creative control, but it wasn't an easy thing for him to accept. Of course it wouldn't. Why would it be? And so he reluctantly agreed to be available to consult with us at our request. I promised that we would be open to his ideas this was not a hard promise to make. Of course, we would be open to George Lucas's ideas, but like the outlines, we would be under no obligation. And that's got to really like, I, I want to say kind of mess with them a little bit. You know, you're told like, look, we're going to spend 4 billion for like your, your baby, effectively your baby. And you have these ideas and we want to buy them, but we're not under any contractual obligation to make them. But we also want to hire you on to make sure you're a consultant. We want to make sure that you are ready at a moment's notice to come in and tell us where we're going wrong or give us feedback. But keep in mind, we're under no obligation to do it. Such a confusing thing. I, mean, I know it's business. I get that it's business and Iger, 45 years he's been working in this industry. Like that's his, that's his deal. His deal is business. I get that. But when you talk to a creative person who is a businessman, let's be fair here, but still to a creative person about their baby and you kind of jerk him around like this, I can see him being a little bit on the, on the ticked off side. Uh, now it talks about here uh, on revealing to George that they were not going to be following his plot outlines. He says early on, Kathy brought in JJ and Michael Arndt to, uh, up to Northern California to meet with George at his ranch and talk about their ideas for the film. George immediately got upset as they began to describe the plot and it dawned on him that they weren't using one of the stories he submitted during the negotiations. Man, I would not want to be in that room. I would not want to be in that room when like, would you want to be the man who breaks George Lucas's heart? No, no, you would not. But JJ Abrams very much wants to create something himself. He very much wants to create his own story. He's, he, you know, he, he, he wants control and I get it. He's been successful, but man, just George, it goes on. The truth was Kathy, JJ Allen, and I had discussed the direction of which the saga should go. And we all agreed that it wasn't what George had outlined. George knew we weren't contractually bound to anything, but he thought that our buying the story treatments was a tactic, uh, a tacit promise that we'd follow them. And he was disappointed to hear that his story was being discarded. And I, I get it, man. 
He this is this is his his finale to the Skywalker saga. What he had envisioned, his mind. It, it you know what? Let him come on to steer the ship. Let him come on to steer the ship. Don't you don't need to sit there and like you know do it hundred percent. But to, to get the theme, to get the feel, would be fine. I mean, the best Star Wars movie is one that he wrote the outline for, and he was very much involved in making. But he didn't write it, and he didn't direct it because he's a better storyteller via producer than he is on his own. And I think we all know that. But man, that was oh my god. Anyway, uh, Bob goes on to say, "I'd been so careful since our first conversation to not mislead him in any way, but I and I didn't think I had now." but I could have handled it better. I should have prepared him for the meeting with JJ and Michael and told him about our conversations that we felt it was better to go in another direction. I could have talked through this with him and possibly avoided angering him by not surprising him. Now in the first meeting with him about the future of Star Wars, George felt betrayed. And while his whole process would never be easy for him, or while this whole process would never be easy for him, we'd gotten off to an unnecessarily rocky start. You bet. I, I look I, okay. The fanboy in me is like you betrayed George, Arr! but at the same time, the business person in me gets it. Now Iger here is at least admitting his failings, that he should have prepared him for the conversation. He should have been the one himself to break the news that they weren't going to be following the outline that they had originally that, that George had originally sent in. And I get that. I do understand that they want to go another way. They drop four billion. They can do what they want, right? I get it. But the way he went about it, the way that they did it does feel like a slap in the face. And I don't know if JJ and Kathy and, and Alan uh, were in on it or if that was ever their intent. But again, this is his baby. This is his world. This is his thing. I mean, come on, guys. You figure something would have been done, right? Anyway, now this is where it gets kind of savage. On George seeing Force Awakens for the first time. Just prior to the global release, Kathy screened The Force Awakens for George. He did not hide his disappointment, saying, there's nothing new. In each of the films in the original trilogy, it was important to him to present new worlds, new stories, new characters, and new technologies. In this one, he said, there wasn't enough, or there weren't enough visual or technical leaps forward. He wasn't wrong, but he was also appreciating the pressure, but he also wasn't appreciating the pressure we were under to give ardent fans a film that felt quintessentially Star Wars. We'd intentionally created a world that was visually and tonally connected to the earlier films to not stray too far from what people loved and expected. And George was criticizing us for the very thing we were trying to do. I get, I get it. Uh, looking back with the perspective of several years and a few more Star Wars films, I believe JJ achieved the near possible, creating a perfect bridge between what had been and what was to come. And... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I will. I look, I'll get, I will, I will give JJ and Lawrence Kasdan and the cast and crew credit there. They definitely did what they, what they could to bridge the gap, to skip over what we knew of with the prequels, because that had been the in-between, right? And to go back to 1983 and take it forward, you know, 30 years, 30, was it like 35 years or whatever, 34 years into the future and what that might look like post empire now into the first order. And the thing is to a lot of us out there, and I think even George himself, the prequels, because they're so recent, are what we see in our mind. The prequels did represent technological leaps forward, visual leaps forward. We know that because he now had the technology to do it. I mean, one of the very first, uh, what was it? Uh, Revenge of the Sith. You know, um, they, Spielberg came in and directed a scene and he directed a scene because there was, uh, you know, it was shooting in digital and he'd only shot in film at that point in time. Right. Like we know what Lucas was attempting to do. And Lucas's mind is always wanting to go further, you know, higher, further, faster to quote Captain Marvel. That's what he always wants to do. And here JJ was stressed in trying to create a bridge between the two trilogies. Neither situation was perfect. And I do think JJ did the best of his ability. I really do. But you can almost see the disappointment in his eyes at that point. You can almost see that just the disappointment in his eyes from 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 that whole situation. And I really kind of wonder if down the road, if that changed at all a couple years later when he said this, that The Last Jedi was beautifully made. Now, he was being polite when he watched it. We don't know his true thoughts on it. We don't know his true feelings on it. The movie was beautifully made, even if the story was crap. And were there technological leaps forward made with that movie? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, it looked really good, you know, comparatively speaking to like the prequel trilogy in, in regards to graphics and even... And even uh, the uh, the Force Awakens, 
I feel that there was better CG, but we've had like, we've had leaps and bounds made in that department, a lot of it because of Marvel. But we have to also remember, we have to go back to to why to to why exactly Lucas sold. If Lucas wasn't happy, then why did he sell it? You know what I mean? And the truth of the matter is, it does kind of go this headline kind of summarizes it perfectly. George Lucas blames fan criticism for killing Star Wars. It says George Lucas told the New York Times this week that there will be no Star no more Star Wars films and that he's essentially retiring. Mr. Lucas cites the enormous criticism from online fans and critics alike for killing the franchise. Now, I want you to note that date there, January 20th, 2012. That was right after the release of Red Tails. And if you recall Red Tails, that was a movie Lucas was so excited for, so happy. He made all the rounds. He went and did all the promotion himself. He was on even The Daily Show talking about it. He wanted to tell the story of the Tuskegee Airmen and the movie just bombed because it really wasn't very good. And at the time, he just felt done. He felt defeated. He felt, he put, why put so much heart and energy and love into these projects I want to make if no one is going to like them? And I get it. I get it. So Iger steps up and freaking nine months later, nine, 10 months later, they have a deal made to sell it to Disney. And they kind of betrayed George in the process, I think, to make sure he was going to go along with it. I think they got him in a bit of a weakened state. I do. I think they got him in a bit of a weakened emotional state. He knew what he was doing. I don't want to like sit there and absolve him from anything, but he knew what he was doing, but he still maybe wasn't in the right mindset. You know, if all he sees is the criticism, but not the love, you know, the 30 years of love uh, that he, that, that people have, then it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, you can get it. He just wanted out. So he sold it. And then they kind of said, Hey, we'll, we'll still use your stories. And then they didn't tell him when they weren't going to use the stories, but at least he sell he told him exactly how he felt. And maybe he felt the way that fans felt. Maybe he felt the way that a lot of fans felt looking at the movie. And that's my question to you by looking at the force awakens. Do you think his criticism matches your own? It didn't actually move anything forward. It didn't do anything technologically impressive or visually impressive. It was more of a bridge, which is how I view it. And I'm fine with that. I like the force awakens quite a bit, but I ask you your thoughts and your opinions on this one. Let me know down in the comments below. I will talk to you guys later. Have yourself a great day. Please thumbs up the video and subscribe. Click that bell. And if you really want to help out the channel, if you like what I do, if you listen to me every day, consider tossing a dollar to Patreon. Link below in the video description. Have yourself a great day, guys. And peace out.